welcome again to Searching for Answers. We're in the book of Acts. If you'll get your Bibles and different uh, interpretations, we're about to, to go in the second chapter and uh, we'll continue on from there. My name is Carolyn Thompson and on my right is... Gerald Winslow, Loma Linda University Medical Center. John Jones, the School of Religion at La Sierra University. John <coughs> Brunt, the Azure Hills Church. Ivan Blazin, School of Religion, Loma Linda University. John Brunt, would you begin with verse 22? Sure. In the chapter 2 of Acts. All right. Men of and Israel. I have the New Revised Standard Version. Tonight. All right. Mm -hmm. Acts 2, 22. Mm -hmm. Right. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience <clears throat> corruption. Maybe it's very good, okay. very good. All right, there's several, several questions I have here. Um, brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Is that still going on today? Or do we have a little... It didn't quite well, last I, all the way. Well, I think Jesus becomes the <coughs> descendant who stays on his throne forever because Is that who, Jesus what it's is talking about there? Mm -hmm. okay. That Jesus is going to be the one okay. who sits on the throne. Now, there's a little bit of a problem here in that the text he quotes, mm -hmm. Psalm 16, mm -hmm. um, seems when you just read the, the psalm itself for David to be talking about himself. He is saying that the Lord isn't going to let him go down to yeah. Sheol or Hades. The Lord isn't going to let him suffer because he's been faithful to God. Mm -hmm. And he is sure that uh, God is going to reward that. But now Peter comes along or through Luke and says, well, David knew that this was talking about Jesus because he was a prophet. And uh, I don't know what all of you gentlemen have to say about that, but it does <laughs> seem that when we read the psalm, we would never know right. that this was a prophecy of the future. It seems was to David make a prophet? Perfectly good sense. He's called a He's prophet. He's called a prophet. I here. know, but I didn't think yeah. of him as a prophet. But the psalm makes perfectly good sense in David's own context as a psalm yeah. about yes. David's confidence yeah. that God is going to reward his faithfulness. Well, we just have to say, it seems to me, yeah, on the one hand, you could say the Old Testament points forward to Jesus. But on the other, other hand, Jesus, or his coming, interprets the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So that that Old Testament text is read in the light of Jesus and the reality mm -hmm. of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. And there are dimensions then that, that are seen in it that you might not have seen at first. Mm -hmm. It's applied that way. 
The yeah. Old Testament yields to New Testament interpretation. And it, it is yeah. true that there seems to be a certain incompleteness about the psalm, doesn't there? Because mm. David expresses his confidence that he's not going to die because God is going Promised to him. reward his faithfulness. Mm -hmm. But yet, David did die. And yeah. so... Mm. Well, listen, not yet die. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, his enemies aren't going to get him. He's going to be delivered. Right. And he was. Mm -hmm. And That's yet, right. <laughs> the eternal... Uh, upholding of David, in fact, is is described as one of his offspring taking the throne, finally, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. So even back in that time, people thought of mm, going on forever as going on forever through your descendants in some way. Mm -hmm. yes. So the idea that the Davidic household would continue to rule, I think, mm. was a source of some confidence to David and uh, some comfort as well. Mm -hmm. But it's true. Excuse me, well, Jerry. Go no, ahead. No, no, finish. finish. Well, only this, that uh, <laughs> the whole notion of the, the technical term is divine sovereignty or sacral kingship, if you wish. We, from Egypt to Mesopotamia, Babylon, we have all of these representations of rulers in Egypt. Pharaoh sitting stiffly with hands on knees, you know, the funny, and standing alongside will be taught or, or another one of these divine figures, hands on shoulder, the message is clear. Um, this is my guy, don't mess with him. If you do, you're messing with me. And Israel had that same notion. Therefore, you have these words on the lips of a king simply, simply joining his rulership to divine endorsement somehow along the way. So that, that means... Um, uh, the, the ruler and God in a theocracy are essentially one and the same power. Mm. Uh, there are a number of psalms. They are th enthronement psalms, really, is what That's they right. are. They are. That's throughout. And the, the early Christians yeah. saw, they read, read, read his, all yeah. of those enthronement psalms, really, in terms of Jesus. That's right. They? Exactly. Because he is the ultimate offspring of David. Yeah. That fulfills yeah. Mm. the hopes that people had that David's yeah. lineage would continue on. But, but let me just reflect back what I'm hearing, or maybe, maybe read between the lines what I'm not hearing. You're not suggesting that David, as he gave this psalm, had in mind some predictive prophecy that would lead to the Messiah. I think Peter had, was suggesting that. Right. And, and part of the reason for saying in the text here, right after quoting the psalm, is that, um, you know, David died and he was buried and we know where his tomb is, right? <laughs> and even, but the psalm itself says, I, I won't die and be buried and decay. So you have that, we've already spoken of that ambiguity. So <laughs> this, that dissonance, if you will, mm -hmm. his promise that he won't experience that and the fact that we know he did opens the way perhaps to use this in a new light. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus gives ultimacy to these texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really like what that. happens. Mm -hmm. So there, it's, it's really reappropriated. I don't know quite the right word. It's reheated, you might say, oh, but yeah, it's like reappropriated. Re <laughs> it's reappropriated yeah. or recycled for a, for a larger purpose here. It had an original idea in mind as a reassurance to David, but it becomes uh, a source of reassurance to the church and to the people hearing this message. I that's think right. that's very typical of what the early church did repeatedly, mm -hmm. and particularly with the enthronement psalms. That was rich uh, mining ground for them to, mm -hmm. to pull these uh, new meanings out of the text. Mm -hmm. okay. By the way, oh, just okay. a little footnote mm -hmm. on this. Um, you notice that Where are uh, you? Peter, well, in the, this whole part of the, the end of, the, of his speech, Peter and the disciples met in the upper room mm -hmm. when they were waiting for mm -hmm. these tongues to come. Mm -hmm. So they're apparently in that proximity and then he says, we know that David died in his tomb. You know, we know where mm -hmm. his tomb is. It's mm -hmm. with us. And uh, that has led to the fact that if you go to Jerusalem today, they will take you to a building mm -hmm. that is supposedly the upper room upstairs and David's tomb downstairs. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Since he knew where it was, they figured it was right there. And of course, the, the tradition for either one of them going back is yeah. uh, middle yeah, ages, is huh? middle ages, and yeah. much much later. But it's interesting that they uh, they put those things together from Peter's speech, and so you yeah. go to the building and. There you see, supposedly an upper room upstairs and a David's tomb downstairs. Yeah. But, uh, Have you looked way down <laughs> deep to see Abraham and Sarah, <laughs> their tomb? You know, it's yeah. way down yeah. there, yeah. yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that um, 
For it was not David who went up into heaven. Rather, he said, the Lord said to my Lord. Now, is that what David? The Lord God said to my Lord, the king. That's right. Mm -hmm. Sit here at my right side until I put your enemies as a footstool under your feet. All the people of Israel then are to know for sure that this Jesus whom you crucified mm -hmm. is the one that God has made Lord and Messiah. And then he didn't say, and boy, I've got it into you for you. You crucified the Messiah. You're never mm -hmm. gonna make it. You're in deep trouble. But he doesn't say that at all, does he? When the people heard this, they were deeply troubled and said to Peter and the other apostles, what shall we do, brothers? Peter said to them, each one of you must turn away from his sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven and you will receive God's gift, the Holy Spirit. Mm. For God's promise was made to you and your children and to all who are far away, all whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Yeah. Now, see, I'm, I'm just amazed that when they crucified Jesus the way they did and taunted him and beat him, that afterwards when they're talking about this and Peter's talking to the people and they're listening and said, you know, you crucified him. Oh, we did. Well, what can we do? Well, yeah. confess your sins and be baptized. He didn't say, sorry, folks, you've had it. You don't stand a chance. But I think it's so gracious of God to say, we know you didn't realize it. Just go ahead and confess your sin, and you can be saved too. Well, if you look at Acts 3.17, Carolyn, right on your line here, We'll be getting to this more fully a little later, but, and now, friends, Peter's talking. I know that you acted in ignorance, mm -hmm. as did also your rulers. So even those mm -hmm. who were in authority at that time, there was an ignorance that they had as well. Yeah. And so Luke acknowledges this, and that, uh, mm -hmm. that makes some difference in how we uh, evaluate all of this. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, it is true that Luke's Peter, the Peter whom <laughs> Luke gives us here, it doesn't soften this too much. Verse uh, 23, he already says, you nailed him to a cross. And then again, down in, uh, in uh, verse 36, whom you crucified. But it is done, nonetheless, by proxy, mm -hmm. through the hands of godless men, and uh, even the rulers. So... Um, that's uh, the Rome. Does, That's the yeah, Rome. Exactly so. Mm -hmm. So when Peter brings this home to them, you men of Jerusalem and all of Judea, hear me, <laughs> uh, he, is, he, is, he is focusing in on his own fellow Jews here in yeah. new ways. And I think that's what catches them. Yes. Finally. But then, there's, see, there's another side to the story. Yeah. We haven't uh, talked, Carolyn, too much about, uh, we haven't talked at all yet about verse 23. <laughs> See, there's a responsibility they have for, for leading to his crucifixion, right? Mm -hmm. Are you in... Uh, Acts 2.23. Oh, 2.23. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on 3.23. Yeah, now it says mm -hmm. in 2.23 that notwithstanding and or going along with the fact that they had handed him up, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan yeah. mm -hmm. and foreknowledge of God you crucified. Yeah. And that My is, Bible says Jesus would be handed over to you, and you killed him by letting sinful men crucify but him. But where is the part about uh, that, uh, God's uh, according to God's plan and foreknowledge? But God, God had already decided, decided that yeah. Jesus would be handed yeah. over to you. So what I, the reason I point to that is there's a two-fold sword. There's a two-edged yeah. sword there. <laughs> One is what they do, mm -hmm. and the other is the divine intention that runs yeah. above and beyond and through all the actions of human beings and how we get together God's divine sovereignty with human mm -hmm. uh, action mm -hmm. is a very interesting kind of question. Yeah. It's a big, yeah. deep well, question. It, it comes up again, Ivan, in that text you were quoting from Acts chapter 3, verse 17, um, because it goes on in verse 18. But this is how God fulfilled what he'd foretold. Right. Um, so both in, in Acts 2 and 3, there's this sense of foreknowledge, God's plan, he foretold it. And in a... So, I mean, let's put the question really bluntly that has to come to people's mind. Are the, are the people who play out this 
their roles in this. Are they simply following a script that was already written? Are they chessmen on a board that yeah. God is moving around? More like puppets or on Or did he yeah. foretell that because he knew what was going to happen? Well, but uh, their plan, his, uh, God's plan. But look at chapter 4, verse 28. Okay. And you, here you got this again. Uh, it says in verse 28, what happened was they did whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that is strong, mm -hmm. really strong. And so how, how do we put together the human action and will along with the divine will? It's still occasion for repentance because each time exactly. this point is made, mm -hmm. it good. comes around and says, therefore mm -hmm. repent. Yes, yeah, you're good. right, That's you're good. right. Yeah. So somehow mm -hmm. maybe they don't look on the divine um, yeah. predestination in quite the way we do, yeah. it's something rigid mm -hmm. and and fixed. Well, that's, I mean, that's a point worth dwelling on because if you're just puppets on a stage mm. yeah. acting out somebody else's script that was designed ahead of time, what nothing are you doing? Also acting out the repentance? I mean, you, you, <laughs> yeah. there's nothing to repent from if, yeah. if you're puppet. Puppets don't repent. Right. So there must <laughs> be something in the volition of the people that, that requires repentance. Yes, without a doubt. Or else it would... Uh, this, I mean, you could play out the story while even the repentance is just acting. Uh, that's further step in the script, but that really changes the story. Well, does yeah. God act mm -hmm. through the free will decision? Here's a paradoxical way of saying it. Does God act through the free willed, freely willed decisions of people? Mm -hmm. If we can put that together that way, God acts through it. I mean, you know, there's a political level to Jesus' death, what they decided and what mm -hmm. they did, and they handed him over to the Romans and they crucified him. But the New Testament says, that there's something beyond and above all that and in and through all of that. And it's God. Somehow and, this and, becomes a sacrifice. And isn't it because Luke wants to make it clear that this death was not just an accident? Exactly thing. right. Mm -hmm. it's not Jesus an accident. was not just a victim of circumstances. Right. He is the fulfillment of a plan. That's right. Yeah. You yeah. have to say this. Yeah. What, could it, what does that make God the Father out to be? one who wants to procure our salvation, even mm -hmm. through the negative things that human beings do. God will work there and bring good out of what is bad in many ways. Okay, did he foredestine the crucifixion of Christ? Well, if, I, you know, if we quote that text again, it sounds like he did. That's, that's a certain way of speaking. We have to understand what it means. But, but if you it, wouldn't... Oh, go ahead, John. Good. You wouldn't take, we wouldn't take that to mean that these exact people had to be involved. I mean, no. yeah. Yeah. We, when, the, when we come it. to I the think crucifixion, mm -hmm. there were people, there was this Roman centurion, for instance, who says, you know, truly this was an innocent man yeah. or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or the Son of God in another mm -hmm. uh, gospel. Um, people apparently still had choices to make right. there. And they didn't have to be part. Right. But he knew they, what they, they were going to yeah, choose yeah. to they do. They could choose which side they were going to be yeah. on. His plan point. is larger than the details of the story. Right. He, in his plan, he will give his son yeah. for the world. But now here's how it plays out with human action involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But somehow you still have to have, you know, you know, like in Revelation, you have the land sl lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. It antedates all the human actions on earth. God so loved the world, he gives his only son, is to quote John here. I, Not you, but it the seems to me that the, the reason we belabor this, though, is because one way to read it is just to read the text the way it plainly reads right here. This was all according to God's plan. In the tra one translation I have here tonight, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very strong that's language. very strong. Yeah, God's purpose and yes. foreknowledge. Right. But the reason we're belaboring it is because we don't want to give up on the notion of human freedom. Right. Without freedom, the yeah. whole principle of love for which this uh, story has um, as, well, its, its, as its sort of main emphasis um, doesn't make any sense because there is no coerced love. And it also doesn't make much sense to say the people heard this and they were cut to their heart. That sense of sadness yeah. doesn't make any sense at all right. unless it could have been right. otherwise. It exactly. could have been otherwise. Yeah. Well, don't we have to keep often two things in mind? And we try to harmonize them. Divine uh, providence or divine uh, intention 
and human action. I think we have to speak of both of those, even though it's harder for us to see just exactly how, um, how that all comes together. I one time heard a guy say, well, you know, God, uh, we see only two sides of a house at one time. God can see all four sides of a, the house. But also, are we forgetting that God let this play out to show the onlooking universe how far Satan would go. For sure. And wasn't it then, after that, after the crucifixion, didn't they then see Lucifer for what he really was? And up until that time, do you think they had a few doubts about Lucifer? About mm -hmm. what he said about God and God's character? Hope and so. But when, they, when he got... Mm -hmm. I think he inspired men to do what he did. And when they, see Lucifer was trying to destroy God so he could still live on this earth and be the prince of this world. But when Jesus was like a lamb led to a slaughter, didn't open his mouth. Have any of you ever seen a lamb overseas when they bring it in to um, shave off the wool and everything? You know, they'll struggle at first and then they just are limp. And then the person who is doing the shearing can do anything he wants. And the lamb just lays there quietly. Yeah. And I thought of, uh, when I've seen this, I thought of Jesus because he didn't open his mouth. He, he just let them do what they did. And so this must have impressed the onlooking universe to the point where they at last saw mm -hmm. Satan for what he really was. Yeah, God is the one on trial ultimately here. You're right. Yeah. God is a God's character is exactly. at stake here. Uh, but there's not <clears throat> that many people that realize that. Mm. You know, Jerry, I, I'm haunted by your question. It could have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can only imagine that that in some some abstract sense that's got to be there, you know? At the same time, we've got something like 3,000 people here repenting. I don't know if all 3,000 individually were involved in the horrors of the previous few days. Uh, John, I think, has put his finger on it. John, when you said, um, yeah, uh, this is a matter for individual decision, quite apart from the overall divine plan. And that 3,000 number helps me kind of see that a bit. So here we have people who may not have been directly involved, but nonetheless who are touched and who mm -hmm. say, whoa, wait a minute, what, mm -hmm. what do we do here? Mm -hmm. yeah. And why they're touched is because God, so behind God is, is this plan that yeah. this one mm -hmm. should... I mean, yeah. you have over here in Acts 17, I just came across this just a moment ago. Paul is in Thessalonica, mm -hmm. and what is he doing? He's explaining and proving that it was necessary mm -hmm. for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead. New notion. Yeah. The, new idea. Yeah. And, but, but, the, but yes, absolutely. But the necessity of it, I mean, without the self-giving God, who in Jesus reveals himself, that, that's something that must be. No matter how it works yeah. out, mm -hmm. it must be. One way or another. Yeah. One way or the other. Yeah. Or the uh, one thing, too, the passage, I think, in John, right, where Jesus says, no one takes my life, I, I give it uh, up. And I yeah. take it up yeah. again. There you yeah. go, another yeah. dimension of uh, thought. Right. It is an interesting contrast when we're told in verse 40 of chapter 2 that Peter, the word in the original is Peter seriously or solemnly bears witness to them. Now, this is a pretty heavy moment. This whole mm -hmm. thing started with people shouting and celebrating, as you said so well last time, or a couple of sessions back, Jerry, singing the Hallelujah Chorus or so. But now Peter deliberately cuts through what could be misunderstood as hilarity with a, a very, very straightforward and serious piece of business. It's a deliberate contrast in style, I think, with the, what could be mistaken as drunkenness. No, he, he is all, he's very stern about this, isn't he? 
Right. Yeah. yeah the, in this translation, he warns them rather sternly, and he pleads. Yeah. With mm -hmm. them at the same I have time. that too. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and and save yourself from this corrupt yes, generation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, sometimes, and maybe I just raise this question. Sometimes when you hear about the three thousand, and you pointed out, John, that mm. maybe they weren't all mm. participants in this. Mm. To what extent is it appropriate to say, I'm going to repent anyway because I'm part of this people. Mm. I participated in these attitudes. Well, there's a corporate consciousness that was important. Well, Jesus, yeah. what does he do in, in the Gospels? He goes and they're yeah. being baptized by John the Baptist mm -hmm. and he goes and stands mm -hmm. with them, mm -hmm. identifying himself mm -hmm. according to the lines that you were just speaking of. See, we live in such an individualistic culture, it's very hard to get an, across the notion that that we're part of a people that may a need perverse to generation, <laughs> eh? right? That, that we're that stiff-necked people <laughs> that uh, sometimes shows up in the in the Bible, and you know we could, <laughs> it would extend this conversation a long time if you if you asked, well, what would we need to repent of today? If but I don't have any trouble looking back over my life time and realizing that I held certain beliefs or whatever or participated in certain systems that when I look back on them I have to say that was really wrong mm -hmm. I, I should be cut to the heart well what even if I wasn't even if I didn't actually yeah. set up the thing and what is it that cuts these people to the, to the heart isn't it the picture of the Jesus who brings us to forgiveness of sins through his death and so on? Well, yeah, that's what your cuts heart, us to the heart. That's mm -hmm. right. Your heart is touched and it mellows you and uh, you ask for forgiveness. And it, we've got 34 seconds. Mm. And does anybody want to say something really quick? Because <laughs> we're about ready to mm -hmm. say, this is Carolyn Thompson. So we got 20 seconds. Repent and be Re baptized. Re <laughs> yeah. okay. That's the short, that's the short yeah, sermon. That, that's very good, Jerry. And we all should repent, shouldn't we? All right. Uh, next time we're going to continue in the book of Acts. And this is Carolyn Thompson for Searching for Answers.